Cook's house. It's time for us to get back to our book club. How far are you in dream? You are locked on Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Cougars, a podcast about your Houston Cougars, and this is a bonus series we're doing. We're doing a book club, a live talk through of Dream, the life and legacy of Akeem Olajuwon with the author, good friend of the show, Mirren fader uh if you've missed it we've already done we did a precursor way back when the book was announced that's in this playlist on youtube as well uh we did an episode a week ago that broke down the prologue and the intro and stuff like that uh today's episode is going to look at the start of the story which actually starts in 2014 in the infamous gym in the woods okay so this is going to be talking through the prologue chapters one, two, and three, and gave you a little preview of some of the fun stuff happening in chapter four. It does talk as if you've read the book. So if you want to just preview this and see, like, do you want to go get the book kind of as a taster? A, it'll be in the show notes, but you're going to want it by the end of the episode. Trust me. So go ahead, click in the show notes, go buy the book, audio, whatever. Listen to this episode, talk through with Miran and I after the fact. Also, if you have read the book, congratulations on making a great decision. It's a great piece of uh, journalism and storytelling about the greatest Houston Cougar, in my opinion, that's ever been a Houston Cougar. Um, the first two chapters kind of talk about the before the University of Houston and the stuff that was going on in Nigeria and Lagos. And kind of you learn a lot about in, a lot of insightful things, I think, about who Hakeem is as a person because of that. Um, and I think the three, first two chapters do a great job of setting up the person we know in present tense about Hakeem in the roller coaster that is the life and growth of Olajuwon. A great, great read. First three chapters, really, really important setup. Let's dive in and talk about them with Mirren. And you mentioned Giannis. I guess there's probably some circleness there in, in the in books we've gotten to, to read from yourself as well. Um, so, Moving on to the open of the book, the open of the book after the prologue is back in Nigeria. And mm-hmm. um, there was a lot of focus in the open here about uh, the culture and the clothes. And he's so t- tall that there's like an awkwardness to it all. And, you know, it's not supposed to fit someone who's six foot eight at the time and uh, and so on. Um we all think of Akeem Olajuwon's guy who wore short shorts, knee pads, and rec specs, right? Like, like we we don't we don't think of the way like that's very normal for a basketball player in the seventies and eighties. That that's the uniform, right? right. Um, what was I mean? Clothes and culture are intrinsically connected, but yeah. the the focus on clothes in the open here that that was intentional, right? It was. I think for two reasons. Number one, you wanted to, I wanted to ground it like so fully in Legos. And, you know, the thing about Legos, it's, it's such a vibrant place. It's, it's culture, it's food, it's music, it's fashion. And like Olajuwon, you know, would be known for his fashion later in life. Um, and just the way that he dressed was so regal and impeccable, but really like fashion was a big thing growing up. Like they all wanted to, him and his friends wanted to wear the best outfits. And, you know, I mentioned the place that they would go to, to find the best outfits, but it also, I wanted to deeply root it in just the fact that, you know, this was an important part of his culture, uh, traditional dress versus more Western attire. Um, because when he gets to the University of Houston, there's so much um, ignorance and racism um, and really just cluelessness about what Lagos, Nigeria is, what Africa is as a continent as a whole. And so I wanted the reader to know off the top, like he came from a very cosmopolitan, big city. English was the national language. There was fashion, there was this, there was that. Because when he gets to college, people assume that he was poor they made awful comments to him about, quote, coming from the, quote, jungle. Um, and so I just wanted to make it clear, like, no, like he, his parents were really well off middle class. They traveled. They they were very fashionable people. 
Well, and it, it you mentioned it was a thriving metropolitan area. It, it wasn't Houston, I don't guess, but it, it was a large city, right? Yeah. Um, you also mentioned they spoke English in tying things together here with the open of the book and, and LeBron. I, in learning something new on every page, it felt like I didn't realize his high school equivalent was called a teacher's college. Yeah. Uh, well, so at first <laughs> that, that, that sets off a bunch of like, aha kind of moments. Um, ha- right. How, how big a role do you think the fact that it was a teacher's college versus a, you know, a pre-med kind of track or something like how, how much does that have to do with the Akeem we know today? Yeah. Well, I think, even though it is a standard high school in the sense that you would study the same, you know, subjects that a person normally would there, there was um, like a teacher's accreditation part of it. And so I do think, especially going to boarding school and things like that, like he learned, you know, leadership skill and, and this speaking up and teaching. Um, And that was hard for him because as you kind of alluded to, like being so tall, it was a source of shame and embarrassment for him. And so he would hate when the teacher would call on him and he'd have to like read aloud or, you know, the kids would just make fun of him and call him the worst things. And so um, I do think the fact that he went to this, you know, really, really good school, this sort of teacher's element to it, it, it's sort of, you can see the seeds of him learning to speak up, learning to project, uh, stand tall, uh, all the things that you would need as a mentor. He, he's, you know, it's, there's some of it that's intrinsic too. I don't mean to say that it was all taught, um, but it, it does seem to be kind of a weird, like, you know, things just sometimes happen on purpose. Um, and yeah. it, it just works out that way. Um, the second chapter, it, it looks at like, Hakeem as he's learning sports and mm-hmm. I say two things one I'm really glad he didn't stick with handball <laughs> and... but can you imagine how good he would be oh my god <laughs> um, a whole handballer I don't know <laughs> so, so let, let's sit on that for a second <laughs> did you know that going in I had no clue that I, I knew that he was new to basketball at late right. in life I didn't know he had tried other sports. I didn't know that. that like, <laughs> like this was... That's what I'm saying. Like so little was known about his years in Nigeria. The only thing really known publicly, unless you like studied him religiously was he played, you know, football, like, Hey, what we call American soccer. And so it's always like football, 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 but like nobody ever mentions handball. And the more I looked into handball, the more you can see how basketball is related to handball. So if people are, you know, having flashbacks to PE and being like handball, no, it's really, really hard. It's fast paced. You have to be quick. Um, You know, picture kind of like a big point guard in basketball where you can see over your defender and you can see the whole court. That's what he was in handball because he could just see over and he could make a decision really quickly. Um, But you had to get rid of the ball in like three seconds. You had to pivot. You had to do all these things, quickness, court vision, agility, all those things you know, we would see later. But what's also wasn't really known, you know, I think until this book is that people think he he starts playing basketball and then he's done with these other sports. No, he actually played them all together. He would have to be transported from the handball court to the basketball court like mid game so that he wouldn't miss a commitment with either team. Well, and we've talked both in pre pod and on pod about our own ages. And I don't mean to bring out the teacher coach and myself, but back in my day, kids played more than one sport at a time. <laughs> yeah, I knew it. Was I knew it. But they, they did. They did. And I think it's interesting to think about like the way kids specialize now. Right. And Hakeem was kind of the Renaissance man that would never have done that until he got shipped off to the United States, honestly, right? Look, this is such an important point. He doesn't start playing basketball, the sport he'd become a Hall of Famer in, until age 17. So parents out there listening, with your 11-year-old child, it is okay (laughs) if he doesn't have offers by age 13. Like, there is so much time to grow, and Hakeem, I would say, benefited from delaying focusing on one sport for as long as possible. And the fact that he was always playing three to four sports at one time. Keep in mind, he also did track. He also did volleyball. He was just everywhere. Um, and he, in fact, to this day, he's an amazing table tennis player, like for real, like people talk about his table tennis skills. Um, that helped his career. It really did. All right. I want to pause in the action here for if you're reading 
at home or whatever the case may be, uh, to make sure I tell you about our buddies over at Z Biotics, a very cool, new, inventive thing that you might need in your weekend regimen. Z Biotics pre alcoholic probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. And here's how it works when you drink, pre alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. This byproduct, not dehydration, is what's to blame for your rough next day. Pre-alcohol introduces an enzyme uh, to break down this byproduct, and all you got to do is first drink of the night, drink this, then drink responsibly, and you'll feel better the next day. Now, again, that's three steps. Pre-alcohol, drink responsibly, feel better the next day. Go to zbiotics.com slash locked on college to learn more and get 15% off your first order when you use code locked on college at checkout. Zbiotics is back with 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for whatever reason, they'll refund you your money, no questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash locked on college and use code locked on college checkout for 15% off your first order. Well, I, I mean, my 16 month old son, we're looking to have an offer by the time we hit two of those. So we'll see. We'll see. You know, that's a little different situation. Uh, you know, you got to <laughs> get your D1 ballers early. Yeah. Like Kelvin <laughs> Sampson, you know how to get a hold of me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but he also picks up basketball. I think it's easy to think of, especially again, as a, as a guy who teaches and coaches by day. A six foot eight guy is going to pick up basketball pretty easily, you think. A six foot eight coordinated guy would pick up basketball pretty easily. You think right. that's not the case for Akeem. If anything, he sounds like it sounds like he was more naturally gifted in a bunch of other things. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why the whole mythology of dream being a fairy tale and having him be a natural so easy just isn't really true. I mean, that was the beauty of this project to get to interview his first coaches in Nigeria, his former teammates. They're they're in their 80s, their 70s, their 60s now. And I quote from one of his early teammates, he couldn't dribble, he couldn't do anything. Um, and to me, it speaks to the relentlessness and the competitiveness that you can be 17 years old be so not a natural, so awkward, not a place, but through sheer, you know, drive and work ethic and support of community and mentors, you can get better so quickly. The things that he was naturally talented at, those are just the unteachables. Like on defense, he didn't even really know the rules of the game, but he instinctually knew when to cheat over, when to rise up for a block, when to box out to get a rebound. Those are like really, really important Thing. So he had a foundation in him that made him, you know, able to accelerate and learn very quickly. But it took time. It's not like he came to the University of Houston and was a star immediately. Even by his final year, when he was considered the unanimous number one pick in the draft, he did not have an arsenal of post moves. Like his coach, Guy Lewis, would yell at him every single day to not put the ball on the floor, like stop putting the ball down. He was very <laughs> much still learning the game. And then he gets to the Rockets. I would say until his second year did he really begin to have post moves and drop steps and twists and turns. So I, I say that to say is like it takes time to develop. And it wasn't like he was this star coming out of Nigeria. You mentioned the post moves. Um, the third chapter is called Yami. And I actually want to get your your take on, on, on that relationship in a second. Um but that's, I think, the first moment I see a connection between uh, he's watching someone play basketball and sees them do some of the twisting and turning and duck. Is that like mm -hmm. what you call it, like a nugget you're dropping early in the book? I mean, it's it's like the third-ish chapter, I want to say. Like it, it, it's pretty early. Yeah. Like, oh, he's like he's like enamored with like, oh, that guy was like a, a ballet dancer almost on the floor. That's right. put there. Um, so this is the part where as a writer, you're glowing inside because somebody recognized a breadcrumb that you put in the, in the chapter <laughs> and then like return to later. So thank you for validating this, like very <laughs> only pursuit of writing and I read things, I read things, I read things. He read the book guys. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. So as I wanted to foreshadow the fact that the dream shake comes from many places, but one place that people don't know that it comes from is from this 
amazing player named Yomi Sangodei. He's a FIBA Hall of Famer, a fantastic Nigerian center. Unfortunately, he passed during COVID, but he was the one that Hakeem looked up to and idolized. And a lot of um, the people on their teams told me that Yomi's move was like a shake. It was very similar to the dream shake and he was a great shooter. So she, he would do these moves and then get his shot off really quick. So I wanted to show the reader that it's, it's from watching very early on during the stage in Lagos that the shake is sort of like in his mind, in his mind. And then, you know, as he gets older and starts learning post moves from other people, be it Moses Malone or Carol Dawson, the former Rockets GM and assistant coach, he starts honing it and people say, oh, the dream shake. Oh, it comes from soccer. Oh, it, oh, maybe even it comes from handball. And that is true. It comes from a lot of places. But the one place people don't know that it comes from is from Yomi. And that's one of my favorite, you know, nuggets that are reported in the book is that, hey, we want to give Hakeem flowers for his legacy. But I also wanted to give flowers to those that came before him, the pioneers that that paved the way for him. And Yomi was a pioneer that people should know about. Well, and and frankly, that I again, I have not spoken to Akeem. I would assume that he would appreciate that as well, right? He's he's not the kind of guy that's gonna like, no, I came up with that. like that's not him and in, in your understanding either. Well, and that speaks to a larger cultural ethos of like collective over individual. That was something that, you know, a lot of the people that I spoke to emphasized that, you know, when one of us makes it, all of us makes it. And so this this humility, it's it's a huge part of Islam and it's a huge part of the ethos of, you know, this culture in Lagos that I was reporting through of like communal. Nobody makes it alone. We're all helping each other. We all want to help each other succeed. And that is you know, the, the lesson of Hakeem, really, it's like there's a bridge, there's a connection and nobody achieves things by themselves. It You you thank those who helped you and then you make sure to help who comes next. And Hakeem absolutely embodies that in every way. Um, not to sit too long on Yomi in a, in a podcast that's about Hakeem, but um, he does get a chapter of this book and, and unfortunately... And did pass away, obviously, as you said a second ago. Is there what? What would you? How would you say the Yomi story in like an elevator pitch? Like what? Is, what do you know about the Yomi story? He gets a chapter of the book. He's important, yeah. um, but his own basketball career and his own legacy of sorts, besides just the guy that played before Hakeem played. Well, Hakeem never forgot about his idol Yomi, so much so that when Hakeem found himself at the University of Houston, he told local coaches about Yomi and was like, you've got to get this, this kid over here. He's amazing. He's better than me. Imagine like making it and then not forgetting about the person that helped you and then telling coaches about that person. That's pretty amazing. And so through Hakeem's recommendation, Yomi is able to come to the States and he also plays at a nearby university and they see each other all the time. Um, it was really a moving interview with Yomi's um, late wife, um, Delphine. She was like, they were brothers up until the end. Like she showed me pictures of them. And so I think Yomi's legacy, he was this fantastic player. He played over a decade overseas in so many different countries. Um, he really put basketball on the map for Nigeria. Nigeria started basketball later than other African countries that, um, for example, the, the colonies, the, the former colonies that were colonized by uh, the French. They picked up basketball a little bit sooner. Um, but what Yomi did was he really was a bright spot for Nigeria and he pushed the sport to another level in that country. Pause in the action here to remind you that game time is the best place to get tickets for concerts, theater, sports, comedy, whatever you're feeling like going to in person. They got the best deals in Town. They got the lowest price guarantee, which means 110% back. Credit to your account. If you can find the same section and row cheaper somewhere else. All in pricing. Right now, if you go on your phone and download the app, you can check out the all in pricing and look at this weekend Houston hosting Utah, the homecoming game. You can get in the lower bowl for $28. $28 ticket game time. Download the game time to app today. Use promo code locked on college. Uh, sorry, that's locked on college for twenty dollars off your first purchase. You can take the escrow to buy tickets again. Create an account, redeem code locked on college. You'll see L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E for twenty dollars off. Download game time today. What time is it? It's game time. 
And their relationship, you said, is is, is brother like. It was almost peers in that sense. So, it, okay. it, right? Yeah, and and they made each other better. I mean, Yomi would play at Fondi too, so he was well aware of Moses Malone and all these other people. And so um, they just they would spend hours at each other's apartments, and in the summer, like you know, go to this place, go to that place, listen to this music together. I mean, they were really friends. Well, and I, I looked up just quickly. Um, it looks like he's a little shorter. It, it, I, I don't mean to say <laughs> like I, yeah. I think there is some natural gift in this whole thing. Right. Right. Um, right. And that's just the way that that goes. Sometimes basketball is a weird right. game in that way. Right. Um, I, I don't mean to go chapter by chapter completely, although I, I could. Right. My fate. I've loved how each chapter is a single word. Like, like <laughs> yeah. center. Yomi. He is a to like team. help me figure out what it means. Yeah. Um, chapter four is called ticket mm -hmm. and this is the moment where we myth bust for a second so yeah. while, while you know peek behind the curtain here we're recording before the book's out in public unless you live in newport apparently <laughs> um, <laughs> but i i want to talk about this as if people have read it because this will not be out until after the book is out and so this part of this won't be this is the myth busting this is the jaw dropping this is what I've heard this story every single time in my life told, like right. specifically told one way. There's a five slam a jamma documentary that tells the story one way. And then Mirren Fader <laughs> does her research and is like, you're all wrong. <laughs> Little there on what's coming in chapter four as a came on is ending up at the University of Houston. Uh, this is a fantastic read if you are a Houstonian, a person that holds Houston close to your heart. If you're a Houston Cougar, shoot, if you're a Houston Rockets fan, if you're a fan of basketball, the international growth, the game, or just interesting stories about fascinating people. Akeem Lodge one of my favorite athletes of all time. I think he's the best Houston Cougar of all time. Mirren does a beautiful job writing this book and telling that story in a way it's never been told before. And so I want to make sure that we have each and every week we're going to be breaking down a handful of chapters. And next week, we're going to go a little bit farther. Okay. Next week, we're going to go from chapter four through chapter eight. That's a lot more reading, but chapter four through chapter eight, eight, Ocho. Eight and talk some about Hakeem Olajuwon's years at the University of Houston, and kind of how that in and of itself was its own roller coaster. Uh, a lot of highs in that roller coaster, and a handful of really low lows that we got to talk with Marin about because she's a great job breaking it down in Dream. If you need a copy, if you listen, to this as a preview, and you'll get a copy of the book. Check the show notes on YouTube and things like that, or just go to Amazon. Uh, Brazos, your local bookstore, anything you need to get the book. Uh, it's everywhere books are sold. It's really, really popular these days. Go grab a copy and follow along as we talk to Marion each week, working our way throughout the entire book. If you're a full length episode, check back in the morning or go check our recaps of the Houston and Kansas football game if you so choose. Locked on Cougs is a daily podcast about the Houston Cougars presented by the Locked on Podcast Network. That means your team. And your athletes like Akeem Lajuan every day. Go Cougs.